Good morning. Uh, Phil, I promise it wasn't me, uh, but uh, we're adjusting the microphone accordingly, or Robbie, I see, today. Yeah. Uh, welcome to the worship of God at First Baptist Church on this, uh, what'll be another hot day in August. We're glad you're here, and I invite you to pull out uh, this uh, bulletin that you have and look inside it at the upcoming church events calendar. And I also invite you, if you're a guest, to go ahead and fill out the card that's in the pew rack in front of you to drop it in the offering plate as it comes by a little bit later. But in this calendar of events, I want to highlight just a few upcoming things. Uh, for instance, we'll, we'll have a finance committee meeting Tuesday night, and that means we'll have a business meeting Wednesday night. Uh, summer activities for youth and children are now over, and we're back on the regular schedule meeting weekly uh, at uh, 6.30 after dinner. Uh, on down, you'll see the nursing home is coming up uh, on Sunday, August the 21st. Sunday, August the 21st is also the day that we will elect deacons. Uh, that is next Sunday. I'm reaching for the ballot here uh, to tell you who's on it. Uh, and the names are, and I'm telling you this so that you can prayerfully be considering it in the next week. The names are Bill Birchfield, Bob Edinger. Andrea Enzer, Douglas Graham, Suzanne Lee, Eric Martin, Betty Nagel, Mike Rogers, Denise Shoemate, and Trent Walters. That's a great slate of deacons, a lot of them. Uh, so uh, next Sunday uh, after church, just like we did last Sunday, we will linger and elect uh, next year's, next cycle's deacons. So that's August the 21st. And then Sunday, August the 28th, you'll notice that the church picnic is coming up again. You're all invited. It's at 6 p.m. in Bartlett Park, shelter number two, which is the one near the bathrooms. Uh, down at the end. Um, and then there are other announcements here to tend to as well, especially the one about Billy uh, being out and any volunteers that want to help with his duties. Uh, that's a good gift. And the back to school uh, supply list. Uh, so all of these are good things as we start to gear back up into another year of church together. I have one further announcement uh, that I need to make this morning so that you don't wonder next week what happened to your preacher. Uh, come Friday, I will be having shoulder surgery uh, and uh, want to make as many aware of that as possible. I will not be here next Sunday. They say that the drugs are quite good and that could be a bad idea for a sermon or a good one, depending on your persuasion. But, uh, but I will be having that done, and I will be out next Sunday. So wanted to uh, make the church aware of that as well. Um, so with all the announcements said, uh, I'll ask you to tend to both scripture lessons today for it's one of those rare days when we get a text in Matthew's Gospel that we're almost certain Jesus based on Isaiah 5, which we will read first. You'll hear the parallels as it's read here in a bit. Why don't you stand up and greet the people around you?
Our hymn of praise, 345 in your hymnal, When Morning Gills the Skies. Let's stand and sing our praises. praise you. We call on you this morning. Hear our prayers, hear our songs. Hold us close if we're struggling today. Speak to us if we're searching. Rejoice with us if we have good news. Walk with us as we share your love with others. Shine on us, Lord, with the light of your presence and accept the praises we bring. In Jesus' name, amen. Join us as we read our litany of invitation and confession together. It is good to give thanks to God, to sing praises in the name of the Most High. We declare God's steadfast love in the morning and the faithfulness of God through the night. The presence of God makes us glad, and the work of God's hands calls forth our joy. We flourish in the vineyards of our God and bear fruit as God tends to us. The goodness of God dwells in both youth and aged, and God's mercy flows through all who receive it. We open our hearts to the love of God and seek to be nurtured and pruned by the gardener. For the times when we, when we fail to bear fruit, we ask for grace. For the times when we do not stand to our own growth, as we have been to do, we ask forgiveness. Sisters and brothers, God keeps God's promises. The large story of scripture says that even when we fail to be faithful to God, God remains faithful to us. We are forgiven. Let 
Let us lift our voices in thanks and praise to God. The prophet quickly recounts the long history of God's relationship with God's people and then, be, and then begins to relay God's frustration at their resistance to growth and harmony. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for, me, my, for my vineyard than what I have done for it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasing planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. Here ends the first lesson. Good and gracious God, we gather again for another Sunday, your people in worship. We gather again for another Sunday, O oh God, around the text of one of your prophets. We hear, we hear those words and we wonder what they mean for us today. We hear words like these that are challenging, words like these that are harsh to our ears. And God, maybe the best we can do is to sit and lean in and listen carefully, for maybe we will be blessed even by the harsh words of Scripture. God, we pray this morning the many things that are on our hearts. We walked in here with them, 
and we will likely walk out with them too. Cares and concerns, griefs and hopes, all these things, God, for just this hour, we trust to you. We ask that you hold them for us, that we might be a people gathered in peace for just a little while. And God, it's such a crucial part of the Christian journey that we pray. And we all know that prayer is something that we learn to do, not something that we were born able to do. So God, we ask that you teach us to pray. Teach us to pray as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying boldly and in one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. all the children please for children's service or the young at heart good morning good morning good morning how's school terrible. oh terrible no you can't have that attitude you're going to have a great year teachers are going to have a great year we're all going to have a great year it's all in the attitude right yeah how many of you all have been watching the Olympics? I have two. Love the Olympics. They're so fun. I've got some facts I want to read to you about the Olympics, which blew my mind. There will be more than 10,500 athletes competing for the medals in the Olympics. There will be 206 countries represented. There will be more than 6 million tickets sold. There will be a record of 6,500 hours of television coverage. It is estimated that about 4 million people will watch at least part of the Olympics. Now, that's big, right? You know, one of my favorite parts about the Olympics is watching them get a gold medal. Have you seen that yet? The USA getting a gold medal. My favorite swimmer getting a gold medal. And, you know, whenever... Um, can you imagine how their parents felt when they watched their child getting a gold medal, their brother, their sister, how, you know, because all these things go through your mind, what obstacles they've overcame in their life as a child, as an adolescent, as even as an adult, what obstacles 
to got them at that point right there. And you know, that's like any parent. You see a child make friends, do something good for other people, be kind to one another, it makes a parent proud, makes them happy when they see their child happy. And it's kind of like how, how God feels about us when he sees us do good for others and be friends to others that don't have friends and help someone that may not have a lot of things like you are blessed to have. And it makes God really, really proud. And that, I guess that's the same feeling a parent would feel. And I can guarantee that your reward will be greater than a gold medal. Let us pray. Lord, we ask these children to have a great school year. We pray for the teachers and the staff and all everybody that have influence over these children. And Lord, we ask you to, to lead us and guide us and have us do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. about a vineyard and about tenants who hindered the owner's desires for the vineyard's growth. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who, built, who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went on to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized the slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he say to these tenants? And they said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to another tenant who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Here ends the gospel lesson. Our hymn of stewardship is a gospel song that's an insert in your bulletin. God will take care of you. Let's stand together as we sing it.
Let us pray. Good and gracious God, God beyond measure, we come to this time in our service and we are reminded that gratitude is the appropriate posture for our lives. As we meditate on the ways that we might give back to you, O oh God, help us to meditate on the ways that we might be generous as we do so in our time, our talents, and of course, our money too. God, we pray in gratitude for our church, its ministries, its fellowship, its caregiving. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.
Well, hello again. You all look pretty good today. Well, most of you. <laughs> I forgot an announcement earlier that I think is important, and that is that uh, Beth Parker's uh, work anniversary has just passed us by. You've been here 12 years now, right? If you would, uh, thank Beth. Thank you for all you do, including the good anthems. Um, so, here we are, continuing our sermon series through the prophets. Are you tired of the prophets yet? Are you tired of these readings yet? Beth Parker is, and rightfully so, I think. We were standing back there getting ready to come in, and Beth said, I can't believe I have to read this about killing them all, and then we'll sing, God will take care of you. <laughs> Liturgy has a way of holding paradoxes together, doesn't it? And, uh, and these sermon, uh, this sermon series through these prophetic texts continues, well, to be kind of a downer in some ways. Now, you don't seem depressed about it, which is good. That means that the liturgy is creating the appropriate nest for these texts. But we have been on a journey through the wilderness with the prophets. Isaiah is no different than the others in a lot of ways. On Wednesday night in Bible study, we were faithful to this text in Isaiah 5. And what I mean by that is we sat together with it and we wallowed. We wallowed. Now that might not sound like much or it may sound like something you have no interest in doing whatsoever. But in certain situations, wallowing is a spiritual discipline. The word that the Bible uses for wallow is lament. Lament. In the United States, we don't care much for lament. We are a culture that prizes winning over all else at all costs. The Olympics holds that up for us very well. Uh, I don't know uh, what all went into that favorite Olympian comment earlier, uh, but Michael Phelps is kind of the uh, American par excellence, the winner extraordinaire, and that's why we celebrate him, right? Katie Ledecky, who blows people out by a whole pool length, well, we celebrate that. In the United States, we don't care much for losers. You see it all the time. Every time the economy turns down, even for a day, or the military scales back, or taxes are adjusted, it doesn't take long for the national conversation to begin circling around a familiar word. Decline. Decline. We begin comparing culture today with our projections of culture past. We bemoan young people. Young people. And point toward examples that confirm what we have to say about young people. We in the United States of America made great made rich, made powerful, made dominant by the hard work of many Americans before us. Well, we have a lot to prove, don't we? A whole lot to prove. We're always trying to prove that we're number one, aren't we? And if the numbers don't line up, well, change the scale because we're America and we're number one. The result of all that is that we in the United States, well, we don't care much for those that we perceive to be losers. We don't care much for lamenting. 
Now, Christy wrote a master's thesis that's getting ready to get hooked in here. Uh, if you have any questions about the sermon, talk to her afterward. Uh, she's right over there. Um, but the word meta narrative is the word that applies here. She wrote way too many pages on that word. Uh, but meta narrative is what we're talking about when we say that Americans like to win. Americans are the best. That is a meta narrative. It is a narrative that guides us. It's a myth is another way to say it. Not myth in the terms of falsehood, but myth in the terms of a great story that gives truth and meaning. And the, the meta narrative of American culture doesn't like losers. However, the Christian meta narrative loves them. Have you ever noticed? The Christian meta narrative absolutely loves the downtrodden, the outcast, the people that don't get it right, the people that mess up. In fact, the Bible is so chock full of people that don't get it right that I don't think that I often find the ones that do get it right. The Bible, well, it's full of losers. Can I say that? Don't call the deacons for a special meeting. But the Bible is full of losers. And it's also full of lament. We read this one in Isaiah. We read another in Matthew. We read dozens of them in the Psalms. Prophets and priests and kings all lament by tearing their clothes in different stories, putting on sackcloth, throwing ashes on their face. Lament is a thread throughout the scripture. What do we do with these two competing meta narratives? What do we do with these two competing stories? I guess I suggest that what we do is we try to we try to separate them out. We try to live by the one and not the other. But it is so hard. It is so hard to do. And lest you think I'm down on American culture, it's not just us. Ever since Constantine converted on his deathbed in Rome and the empire began to be Christianized, Christianity has been accustomed to winning. Ever since the monarchs of medieval Europe, ordained by God to rule, by the way, and crowned by the Pope himself, ever since that has happened, Christianity is accustomed to winning. Ever since Europe sent colonists over to the North American continent. And ever since they brought Christianity with them and built churches and denominations and, and religious structures. Ever since then, with Christianity once again seated in the most powerful nation in the world, Christianity, the church, is accustomed to winning. Now, with 2,000 years, or 1,500 years anyway, of precedent, of being accustomed to winning, what in the world do we really do with this text in Isaiah? We read it, we hear the imagery, uh, but what do we do with it? Isaiah 5 is about a vineyard and its keeper. The text identifies the, pro the poetic passage 
Did you catch what it's called? A love song? Uh, Trish Ettinger aptly asked Wednesday night, what kind of love song is this? I, I agree. I can't hear it because all this cultural tradition steeps me to listen for grace, to listen for love, to listen for hope, and all those things mean winning. But this passage, it's not about winning at all. It reads, my beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes. In other words, the vineyard keeper did everything possible the vineyard keeper worked very hard. He laid out plans and did everything just according to the best methods. Good soil, check. Cleared out the debris, check. The best seed, check. Pie pans and scarecrows to scare away the rabbits and the birds, check. And of course, this gardener expected grapes. But the tone of the message quickly shifts, and we are told that only wild grapes, you know, the small little ones that you can't eat, that just grow in the midst of everything on their own, we're told that wild grapes grew. You can't eat those. We are told that the vineyard keeper laments this and decides that the vineyard is a lost enterprise and decides to undo all the good work that he has done. And while there are a few clues present, it is only near the end of the passage that the vineyard keeper is explicitly identified as God. It's the latter half of verse 6 where it's clear that the vineyard keeper is God. You know, that's even harder, isn't it? If the vineyard keeper is God and God did everything that God could do and the vineyard didn't make it, then God's plans don't pan out either? Then God is also joining the chorus of losers? I saw that grimace. I don't like it either. But it's kind of there, isn't it? What do we do with this passage? Aren't we supposed to win? Aren't we supposed to succeed? Now, I'm no green thumb gardener, but I have been up to the work of growing tomatoes and peppers and green onions for a few years now. My grandparents were gardeners and my parents do a little gardening. Several of my friends are gardeners too. Gardening is just another metaphor for this vineyard scene. The most exciting time of the year for any gardener, at least for me, is the onset of spring. It's about 75 degrees. Winter is gone. Everything's green. And man, am I excited. I'm going to plow. I'm going to line out. I'm going to get my seeds and I'm going to go at this. Every gardener I have known loves spring and loves to be in the garden in spring. The tomato plants, well, they're kind of cute. They're short, very green, and you plant them, and you weed around them, and they don't take a lot of work at that stage. Then summer comes, 
a summer like the one we've had, where it's 90 degrees every single cotton-picking day. 90 degrees. The mild days are replaced by those days. The bright green tomato plants now require constant attention because they're sprawling across the ground. You got to tie them up and tie them up and tie them up. And even if you garden with the experts like I do this year, even if you garden with Anne and Margaret and Patty and Barbara at the Organic Garden Club, even if you do it there and you follow all the directions they give you and you try to weed and you try to water, even then you end up losing tomatoes and tomato plants. It's just part of it. You go out, you get dirty, you sweat, and you lose some of your work, if not all, some years. Now, I want to be clear. I have lots of good tomatoes, too. I attribute that to the people I've named and their, uh, their advice. But, uh, but gardening might be a closer feel for this vineyard keeper than vineyard keeping is. I don't think there are any uh, wine growers, uh, grape growers, winemakers in the congregation. Uh, (laughs) There must be one, best looking at the choir. But uh, other than that one, whoever you are. Gardening, (laughs) that's Jim Woodring. Uh, Good to know, Jim. We'll we'll be by later. Uh, (laughs) Right, Charlie? (laughs) First, I'm sure. Um, Anyway, gardening is, for all of us that don't do the work Jim does, gardening is closer to the feeling of working so hard for something, sweating, getting dirty over and over again, and it not coming out exactly like you had hoped. It just happens sometimes. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. I hear in this vineyard passage, lament. Lament is the voicing of frustration. Lament is the first step on the journey toward healing in the Bible. It's not the end step, it's the first one. And you know what? Even God laments. Even God has bad times. Even God knows what it's like to be disappointed. Now, if you can turn the lament and hear it through the lens of your own gardening experience, then you see the power of it. Too many preachers read passages like this and start spouting off judgment from the pulpit. Too many preachers take a passage like this and begin to unpack all the ills of culture now, comparing it to culture that was. But that's not what Isaiah is asking of us. Isaiah is asking of us to grow to maturity by allowing lament to take its proper place in each of our lives. If you don't lament, then you make life into a series of happy moments that are hollow. I think it was Mark that said the hard times teach us to be grateful for the good times Wednesday night. Did you say that, Mark? Okay, well, we're going to give it to Mark anyway. Um, But the hard times teach us about the good. So, the Bible, this big work full of prophetic works, 
And we American Christians trying to figure out where stories about vineyards fit into our lives. My suggestion, don't go on a witch hunt looking for what caused something like this. Instead, make room to experience the lament. Let it be a part of your journey. Because, after all, Christianity is not about immortality. It's about resurrection. Jesus didn't live forever. Jesus was resurrected. Let lament be part of your journey. It'll make the good that much better. Amen. It is our custom at First Baptist Church that when we gather for worship, when we sing and pray and hear sermon, we offer an invitation. In a lot of ways, the invitation already hangs in the air. The invitation is to embrace life, all of life, and look to God while you do it. Ponder that, ponder the decisions that you make, as we stand and as we sing together.
And now as you prepare to go from this place, I invite you to bow your head and hear this prayerful benediction. Holy God, we ask on this day that you will help us to let the narrative of resurrection resurrect us from the hardship, from the grief, from the trials that we face in our lives. God, we ask that you will let the narrative of resurrection, most fully revealed in Jesus' life, give us courage, give us hope, give us grace to live our lives following you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.